Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a challenge to be able to give this talk uh, to you today in 18 minutes. I have had the good fortune of being able to present this numerous times before, but usually in much longer formats and for considerably different audiences. It's been presented most recently, or about a month ago, at the assembly of the International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva, who do the Geneva Conventions. I presented it to Pentagon policymakers. I gave a keynote at a, a computation and philosophy conference. The theologians have been interested in this, as well as obviously the uh, roboticists and computer scientists. So uh, uh, I look forward not only to giving this talk to you, but to the interactions afterwards uh, that may occur. Um, this is about an idea. Um, and uh, I want to get something cleared uh, from this. I'm not talking about the value of warfare. I have conducted Department of Defense research for close to 25 years. Among other things, I helped work with the Sony Ibo robot as a consultant for 10 years, so it's not all about military stuff. I do not do classified research, so I can, can, I can talk to you freely about anything uh, that I have worked with. And I don't like war, OK? Let me state it bluntly. And if we could figure out ways, oh, I should have mentioned I've given this talk for pacifists as well, too. Um, if we could figure out ways to uh, stop war on Earth, uh, uh, I would encourage you to do so. Unfortunately, I don't know how to make that happen. But I do think I know how to assist uh, in making warfare, as oxymoronic as it sounds, uh, more humane. Uh, and that involves the potential use of robotics technology in somewhat perhaps surprising ways. Now, why are your tax dollars, if you're a US citizen, uh, and our new budget, uh, being uh, channeled into military research uh, at very, very high levels? And much of it addresses the issues of unmanned systems which include uh, basic things like the predators and the reapers, which are flying in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq and other places. Um, but these are the reasons why. One of the goals is for force multiplication, the notion of having one soldier or warfighter to be able to do the task of many. For those of you who do not want a draft, uh, that's a useful uh, activity. Um, and uh, it's also important for maintaining an all-volunteer army, which actually is important for something referred to as the warfighter ethos. Uh, it's, it builds a uh, team and a quality unit uh, out of these individuals. Another aspect of these kinds of unmanned systems is it allows you to fight wars over much larger areas. In other words, expanding the battle space. There are programs in the Navy that have regions that are hundreds, if not thousands, of miles potentially being developed to uh, look for uh, uh, suspicious activity of ships to interdict them, suppose if they were carrying armaments that were embargoed in other areas. Uh, one of the nice things about these systems is they can remain in the air, on the ground, under sea, far longer than human beings can. And they can provide the capability of what's referred to as persistent stare. People get tired. These systems can look at a particular area, region, for long periods of time. The individual warfighter can potentially benefit from these systems as well, too. The notion of being able to uh, look around the corner. It's very dangerous to stick your head around a corner in an urban setting, as you might imagine. Uh, if you saw Saving Private Ryan, I think you saw some of the examples of that. And urban combat is one of the most dangerous types of combat uh, uh, for the military in general and the individual warfighter. If you can send a robot to look around that corner for you, you have gained situational awareness and as such have benefited from that particular uh, knowledge. And of course, this all results in uh, reducing friendly casualties, the force losses on our side. One of the things that hasn't been considered or discussed uh, to date, uh, seriously, until recently, is the notion of how can we help with the uh, aspects of non-combatant casualties and the damage to uh, civilian property as a consequence of that. This work is progressing worldwide at a very, very rapid pace. It's not only the United States that is doing this. Many other nations are. But we can talk more about what goes on in the US because of freedom of information. And I'm only aware of the unclassified programs, which I'll share a little bit with you. Uh, South Korea has developed, Samsung Techwin has developed a platform for deployment, which is currently being deployed along the demilitarized zone. They had a hard time selling it before, but recent events have made uh, uh, it more likely that the government would want to invest in a platform such as that, which has the capability uh, for automatically detecting human beings and engaging them. Uh, the demilitarized zone, as you may know, uh, is a place of war that exists. 
Uh, there is a truce, an armistice, uh, but not a, uh, a peace treaty that has been signed. And there is a line through the middle of the demarcation zone, uh, 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 of the demilitarized zone called the military demarcation line, which if you cross, you will be shot. That's as simple as that. Uh, but everything is warned outside. It is a legitimate action. The rules of engagement, by the way, in general, for that area and other areas are classified because you never want your opponent to know how you are going to fight and when and where and under what circumstances you will or will not engage a particular target. But there are other platforms, such as the swords, which has been uh, in Iraq uh, and Afghanistan. Uh, the more recent version of it uh, is the Mars program, uh, under development and soon to be deployed in those particular areas. As well as the, uh, in that case, that's the Reaper. You're all familiar with the Predator, uh, which is a, has Hellfire missiles attached to it. The best way to describe the Reaper is a, a Predator on steroids, because it has a lot more armament uh, associated with it. But as I mentioned, there are many other nations involved with this. Uh, Jane's uh, lists, I believe, 43 different nations and other sources indicate perhaps there are as many as 56 uh, involved in the deployment or development of these particular types of unmanned systems. The U.S. is well in, in the uh, front uh, of the deployment of this technology. These are not just the unmanned systems that the U.S. is involved with. These are the force-bearing unmanned systems at various stages uh, in development and the unclassified versions of these as well, too. I believe there was 42, if I counted correctly, uh, along this. And they all have the potential for carrying uh, weapons. Now, what's also interesting to note is the long-term vision of the Department of Defense associated with the deployment of these systems. If you look at that banner across the top there, that is the roadmap uh, or plan uh, that extends out to 2034. Okay, that's 25 years. How many industries do you see planning out that far in advance? So there is a serious long-term investment in this seeming what's called revolution in military affairs, RMAs, uh, which deal with things like the longbow and gunpowder and tanks and nuclear weapons. Wars will, it is believed, not be fought the way they have been fought in the past due to the advent of robotics technology. And this is from all sides. And people are planning for that. But interestingly, as I mentioned, some of the ethical concerns deal with the notion of whether a system should have the permission to engage a target on its own. Thank you. Uh, and the decision to fire will not likely be fully automated until legal rules of engagement and safety concerns have been all thoroughly examined and resolved. That statement is an eye-opener in and of itself, because 25 years ago, the statement was, a human being will always be in the loop. Well, what does that mean? The definition of that has changed, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, nearly uh, in, the near, uh, in a few slides. The Air Force, not to be outdone, is planning out to 2047 uh, in their flight plan. They don't have a uh, roadmap, but they say basically the same thing. Authorizing a machine to make lethal combat decisions is contingent upon political and military leaders resolving legal and ethical questions. Ethical discussions and policy decisions must take place in the near term rather than allowing the development to take its own path apart from this critical guidance. That's one of the reasons I'm here. That's one of the reasons I'm speaking to you. We need all to be engaged in this particular discussion as to what we as a nation, we as humanity as a whole, choose to do with the advent of these particular weapons. I said, I might not have said it, but I, there are two fundamental assumptions underlying my position on this. One is that warfare will continue. I believe, unfortunately, that we have this inherent propensity to kill each other, as has been demonstrated since recorded history, and probably before that as well, too. Clausewitz also uh, attests to uh, some of these uh, uh, tendencies uh, much more eloquently than I do. But the notion of, uh, or the second assumption that I'm referring to here is that lethal autom autonomy is inevitable. The ability of a machine to select, target, designate, engage and evaluate a human being. And why do I believe it's inevitable? Because it's already here. There are systems that are already doing that at different levels. The simplest is a landmine, which is anti-personnel landmine, which is technically immoral uh, in many respects because it violates the Geneva Conventions and the principles of discrimination and distinction. But uh, it does sense, 
and it acts, it explodes, okay? So that's a robot by many people's definition. More sophisticated ones deal with the notion of target signatures as recognizing tanks, which are discriminatory and hence not considered banned by the Ottawa Conventions. There are others as well, too. The phalanx system, which has an auto mode operation. You turn it on. The captain has the opportunity to turn it on or turn it off. But because the tempo of warfare is so fast now, you can't do what you did in World War II and say, Captain, there's a bogey at 3 o'clock, and send up the fighters to be able to do that. If that system doesn't engage it, this surface skimming missile, exoset or whatever, that comes in will destroy that ship. He has no choice to be able to push the intelligence and the decision making to the so-called tip of the spear. That's what's happening in this particular space. The, even the uh, Patriot missile system uh, has 10 seconds for an operator to push a button after it picks a target to turn it off. The only way I can think that you would have an ability to be able to fully understand and comprehend the uh, situation as to whether that's a legitimate target or not is if the Patriot missile system is, is burning up or smoking or something, you push the button. But how can a human being possibly digest the information that's necessary to make an intelligent decision? That is the fundamental problem. And the language has been changing. Um, the Air Force is currently using a human on the loop as opposed to a human in the loop, indicating where the decisions are being moved, and a leader in the loop as opposed to a human in the loop, indicating that we will be willing to, if we can resolve those problems, send those decisions to the machines to be able to engage targets. People make mistakes as well, too, and if you want to make a difference in stopping this, one technique is to use uh, international treaties and prohibitions. Here's questions I throw in front of my audience uh, in general, whether they be military or otherwise. Um, should soldiers be robots? What do we train soldiers to do? We try and engineer out much of the emotion in their capability. We try and make them obey orders. To some degree, that is a robotic tendency. The other question I ask is, should robots be soldiers? Could, we, could they possibly act, actually be more humane than human beings? And my contention is they can. They can be stronger already. They can be faster already in certain limited circumstances, like Watson and Deep Blue. They can be smarter than human beings. Why is it not easy to think that robotic systems could treat us better than we treat ourselves? especially in the battlefield. And we'll see that the battlefield is a terrible place uh, for human behavior. Uh, quite literally, in many cases, it's atrocious. I always state in these talks that I have the utmost respect for our young men and women in the battlefield, but they are put into situations where no human being should ever be put. It is, they are not designed, and it's getting worse and worse and worse due to the uh, technology that is being developed. Some of these things are very disturbing. 17% of soldiers and Marines agreed or strongly agreed that all non-combatants should be treated as insurgents. Um, less than half of soldiers and Marines would report a team member for an unethical behavior. If war crimes are committed, they must be reported. That is an onus on the individual. And the list goes on and on. And in one informal survey, uh, sociological survey in Vietnam, there was 100% um, uh, of all the men in heavy combat, 33% of all the men in medium combat, and 8% of all the uh, uh, men and warfighters in light combat either uh, committed in a, uh, witnessed an atrocity or commit, uh, committed or abetted an atrocity. Those numbers are staggering. So these are some of the reasons why uh, when a roboticist learning a lot of this stuff, it's very disturbing. But we have to take responsibility for the technology that we help create. Um, so this was the underlying research thesis for my work, as I mentioned before. I do believe that we can create systems that perform better than human beings under these particular conditions under certain circumstances, which I will describe shortly. I do not claim that they can be perfectly ethical in the battlefield, but they can be better than humans. And if they can be better than humans, what does that mean? It means that we have saved civilian lives. We have saved civilian properties. So if we establish that as our metric, rather than perfection, which is next to impossible to attain in almost anything, um, we will be doing, uh, we will be saving lives. So these are the sorts of things that underpinned this research program that I executed for the Army Research Office uh, and resulted in a book, basically to be able to allow the robot to refuse an ethic, an unethical order and incorporate some of the uh, ethical uh, aspects of the Geneva and Hague Conventions and the rules of engagement. 
As I mentioned, we can't replace soldiers one-on-one. -on -one. That's not the intent. These are to be assets that are working alongside soldiers and with soldiers. They should only be used in specialized missions where bounded morality applies. We're not trying to encompass all those aspects. And for interstate warfare where there's much lower probability of uh, civilian uh, presence. There are many reasons why I believe this is the case. I will not have time to share them all. Some is the notion of acting conservatively. Some is the notion that these sensors will be able, that are being developed, to see the world better, and robots will be able to process the information far faster. And they can also potentially monitor uh, other humans in the battle space. There's many arguments, as you might imagine, that I've heard along the way uh, that say that this is a, a bad idea and these are the reasons why. And they vary uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from the uh, science fiction kind of view to other philosophical issues regarding establishing responsibility, which are important. And I have answers for all or re responses to all of these. Some are easier. The notion of lowering the threshold of entry to war, that's a little more difficult because it speaks to all different kinds of uh, uh, war technology that's being developed. But uh, on and on, proliferation is another concern as well, too. And the military has concerns. The I can't do that, Dave. Uh, kind of scenario that could uh, conceivably uh, come up. But the Geneva Conventions uh, have these four hallmarks. The notion of military necessity, reducing, uh, reduction of, uh, of unnecessary suffering, choosing the right weapon uh, for the particular system and not killing unnecessarily, and discrimination or distinction, being able to tell non-combatants from combatants in this particular case. So these things are important, and we must incorporate them into these systems, in my estimation. We have developed a prototype system uh, that does this. This is a very, very high level uh, description of it, uh, and it shows the data flow through that. Um, there are four components which are outlined in technical reports available for free uh, on my website and also a recent book uh, that covers that, which is not for free. Um, and uh, um, there are many different scenarios in which we tested this. One was uh, a notion of 190 Taliban that were detected in a cemetery by an armed predator. They had to call the Pentagon. Lawyers decided that it was against the rules of engagement to uh, uh, target these individuals in a cemetery. Lots of people were not particularly happy with that because they were uh, leaders in this particular structure. But the point being is it's a no-brainer for an autonomous system to make that decision based on the location of kill zones and GPS technology. It shouldn't have to go that far. There are more disturbing ones uh, which help push me into this field, such as this uh, video, which if you like gore, uh, it's uh, probably still on uh, YouTube. It's called, these kinds of videos are called war porn or brag videos. Uh, and unfortunately, in this particular case, uh, there is a individual who was shot uh, at the end, who was wounded, severely wounded, which is to me, and I will state I am not a lawyer, uh, a violation of the Geneva Conventions against summary executions. You're supposed to call people for help when they are wounded beyond the ability to uh, uh, recover. And uh, uh, the no I asked a JAG lawyer after viewing this at one of my meetings in the military, would you want my robot to take that shot? And he said no. And I think we would need with additional research to be able to do that. I mentioned the uh, Korean one and I'd like to be able to test this out and perhaps we'll get some traction with DARPA in standing up a, pro a program in this. There are videos available on our website that are narrated. If you're interested in learning more, I would strongly encourage you to go visit them. Uh, they're far too long uh, for here. Um, and in summary, these are the major issues. Again, this is a long-term agenda. We have only made baby steps uh, along this. So we are trying to move in this direction and build a community, and build a community to make this happen, a research community and a funding community. And we're starting to get traction in a variety of different places as well. If you're a roboticist or a scientist in general, you need to understand that there are serious ethical issues associated with this. We need to be proactive and a very simplified prototype uh, which demonstrates some of the principles has been uh, implemented and tested. If you're interested in further information, there's lots of it available. I'm involved in these different societies as well too. I do teach a course here currently at the Robots and Society course at Georgia Tech uh, for our undergraduates and there's a cover shot of uh, my book. Uh, and with that, thank you very much.